Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And on behalf of Alice and myself, we want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we Amen. continue on in this ongoing program, this ongoing study. Uh, this time, coming to you from Daytona Beach, Florida, as we begin our travels once again. Uh, we're just blessed that you can be with us. Yes, we are. And we are picking up in uh, Matthew 5, 6. We're doing a study of the Sermon on the Mount out of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Yes. And we're doing the Beatitudes at the moment. And we're going to be doing Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness today. Amen. Okay? Yes. But before we start doing that, I'm going to ask Alice if you will ask God's blessing on our time together. Absolutely. Lord God, we just praise you and thank you. We thank you for your word, your precious word, that brings about change in hearts. And we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to share that word. Yes. And Father, we ask you to fill us now with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And we thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen. Yes, we want to be filled. Filled. <laughs> you know, because it says... Overflow. Filled overflowing. Yes. Yes. Don't get me distracted. No, okay. <laughs> Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Yes. We are filled with the love of God. Yes. Filled means you can't put any more in it, or if you put anything else in it, that overflows. Yes. So as God continues to pour his love, his mercy, his grace, his word into our lives, it should be flowing out and touching other lives. Amen. Amen is right. So, as I said, we're going to look, and I'm using the New American Standard and as, as Alice, version of the Bible. And we, during this program, uh, a number of weeks back, we looked at different versions and how that affects our translation. So I'm going to start by reading that verse, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The King James says that they shall be filled. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've sat down to a meal and you're filled, then you're, you're satisfied. satisfied, right? But if you, for, or for example, are using something other than that, you may find some differences. Some may provide a problem. For example, if you're using that message thing, you'll have a problem with this current study, I believe, because the Word of God does not say you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. Because that's what that version says. And that's different than what we're going to be looking at because it's different than what it says in the original Greek, for sure. All right, but the focus of this and the focus of Jesus' words here is righteousness. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Now, the word says that we are to pursue righteousness. Yes. So, let's just talk about un and understand what righteousness is. It, is it Jesus, well, let me go to Paul in Romans 5, all right? Mm -hmm. Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that word justified there, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that because that same Greek word is translated out and through as either justified or righteous, okay? Because you, you'll see the relationship. Because later on in that same chapter, Romans 5, 19, Paul says this, For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Yes. Right? Adam sinned, and all men became yes. sinners. sinners. Mm -hmm. Jesus, through his obedience, all of us can become righteous. Yes. But the word righteous in the 19th verse is the same Greek word mm -hmm. as the word justified in the first verse. Oh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's a logic to these. See? Both of these words have their, their root in the same Greek word for a judicial hearing, right. okay? Mm -hmm. A court hearing. In other words, 
things being made right mm -hmm. by the application of justice. Yes. Yes. A trial, the verdict, and the carrying out of a sentence. The idea of a trial or a court of justice is more than just a literary device here in the Bible. It's a constant theme in Scripture, okay? And there's a reason for that. Okay, man didn't involve, invent justice. No. God did, yes. right? Yes. And he said, like, way back when, when he called the people out of Egypt, out of bondage in Egypt, and formed them into his people, right? Mm -hmm. He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Did you see it? He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. All right? Yeah. It's, any trial has to have witnesses. Absolutely. All right? Okay. Yes, yeah. Being righteous is about being right with God the Father because justice has been done. Okay? Yes. Jesus was tried. Mm -hmm. Pilate found no guilt in him and condemned him to death. That's right. yeah. This was perfect justice because we were on trial before God. Yes. Right? Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin in our place. Mm. And then he paid the price in full. Okay? Yes. The sentence was carried out. The sentence was carried out on Jesus Christ. The wages, the penalty for sin is death. Jesus died and justice was satisfied. Justice was done and righteousness was accomplished. It has to be that way. You see, the problem is we live in a world where justice can fluctuate. Mm. You know, it depends on how a judge wakes up and feels in the morning. Mm. Or it depends on, you know, it be, because while you have a set of laws, it seems that they're carried out vaguely, depending on too many variables, right? God has a rule, okay? And the rule is the wages of sin is death, period. That's it. No sin, listen to me now, no, no sin. sin goes unpunished. No sin goes unpunished. That, if that sounds harsh to you, well, it's not harsh. It's just. Okay? Because if you say, okay, well, I'm going to give you the, you know, you got to pay the price. But you did, ah, I'm going to show you mercy and you don't have to pay the price. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Mercy and justice have to work hand in hand. All right? So, like I said, Jesus was made, because it, let me quote the scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So we are righteous, yes. okay? That's a free gift from the Father through the work of his Son, the, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So then, if that's true, why do we now have to hunger and thirst for it? Righteousness. All right? What we are to desire with such a passion so desperately is righteous behavior and a righteous attitude. Behavior plus attitude, the Beatitudes. That's, we've been talking about this for a few weeks now, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Jesus is teaching us what righteous behavior is all about. When the people of God had been completely convinced that a religious behavior was what the Lord wanted from his people. It's a righteous behavior, yes. not a religious behavior. Over and over, Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, but I say to you, right? The Sermon on the Mount is not about attitudes to make you happy, but training us as disciples in right behavior and attitude that demonstrates God's love, grace, and power. The Sermon on the Mount is about not about making you righteous. That was the free gift of God. Jesus did that. Right. It's about living righteous showing us how teaching us training us how to live that righteousness yes. everything else is commentary mm -hmm. it's it's a truth you know it is as paul wrote to his son in the faith timothy training the word is training in righteousness so that the man of god may be adequate equipped for every good work that's what it says second timothy 3 16 right and 17 so we seem to take it for granted too often you know um, salvation is free. That may be the single biggest lie yes. in the history of mankind. Salvation is a free gift to us. That's right. 
but it was not free. Yeah. Somebody paid the price, and we know who it was. Jesus Christ paid the price for it. But that free gift, okay? We have that righteousness, but we need to hunger and thirst to have the, you know, it says to pursue righteousness. We did this, we were talking about, I think, the, when we were talking about the Beatitudes in general, we were talking about how, you know, the, the world seems to be striving for happiness. Yeah. It's, in, it's encased in the Constitution of the United States, the pursuit of happiness, when the Word of God is calling us to pursue righteousness. Well, we, if we are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and we are, mm -hmm. what we are pursuing is living, the, the, living out that righteousness yes. here, okay? Hunger and thirst. Now, Alice and I have been blessed. You know, we, we have traveled. We spent a lot of time, well, we spent in the last 40 years, we've traveled... Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Okay. We've been all over the United States, all over North America, all the way through Mexico, all over Latin America. I can't even begin to name all the places. We've been on five continents in 50 different countries, sharing the Word of God, teaching the Word of God. And the fact is, many of the places that we have been, in East and West Africa, in, Latin, in parts of Latin America, we have seen hunger. desperate hunger. We have seen people. We have been so many places where, forget about it, in Africa right now, you know, one of the biggest concern is always water. Yes. When we lived where we were in Central America, when we lived out in the bush in Central America. It was a problem. Yep. Water is, a, you know, there's a desperate problem to have good water. You know, I'm reminded, uh, I don't know if I should be, but I am. Mm -hmm. There was not, not long ago one of the recent James Bond movies. The, I think Quantum of, Quantum of Solace is what it was. Oh. It was about this evil, you know, consortium, and they're trying to capture something so valuable in the world and everybody assumes that they're trying to gain the oil rights all around. What they were trying to gain was the water, the water. Mm -hmm. gain control of the water. Because if you don't realize it now, I, I promise you in many parts of the world you, it is and it will become more noticeable in the West. We desperately need good quality water mm -hmm. and it's disappearing. Yes. Okay, but that's near the area there, right? But hunger and thirst, those are the most powerful driving forces known to man, right? Mm -hmm. Peter wrote, and he said, Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We're supposed to, to long for God's word the way newborn babies long for pure milk, mm -hmm. right? It's that hunger. And that's an overwhelming hunger. Yeah. Babies won't be stilled. I mean, you know, uh, the Mayo Clinic said that most newborn babies need to be fed 8 to 12 times a day. Wow. And they come out screaming, you know. Yeah, I don't know if you know, you know, right? They come out screaming. What are they screaming for? No. Okay. okay. They eat. In the West, vast, vast majorities of people have no concept of hunger and thirst. You know, uh, being a half hour late for lunch at McDonald's is not what this is about. Okay. <laughs> Or complaining because they didn't serve you the food in five minutes. We, we say, oh, I'm hungry. We don't know what hunger is in the West, by and large, all right? We end up saying, oh, I'm starving. Yeah, I'm starving, right. Okay. <laughs> no. Think about this verse. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. Psalm 42.1. It's panting for that water. In most of the world, you can't just go to the tap, turn it on, and get good, clean water. Songs are written about it. Wars are fought over it. And that's the truth, right? As I said, we lived in the bush in Central America where water was never taken for granted. You know, where we lived, when we lived out in the bush, it was like they have two seasons there. It's always hot. The two seasons are wet and dry. That's right. There's a four-month dry season and there's an eight-month rainy season. The beauty of the rainy season is you just put stuff out and catch the rainwater. Yeah. Otherwise, for four months, you go to great lengths to, to, I mean, we had, we were neighbors in a village out in the bush, uh, of the village chief, a man and his wife and 10 children. And in the morning, when they were preparing, when the wife was preparing breakfast, you know, she sent a couple of the little boys off into the bush to gather the firewood. Mm -hmm. She'd send a couple of the girls down to the river, down to the river, which was, my goodness, it was quite a trek. Quite a, quite a trek yeah. with big barrels or jugs, you know, these five gallon uh, plastic 
containers to get water together and water's heavy yes. and you see these little kids you know walking around carrying this water no no tap water you know okay <clears throat> that's what most of the world or so much of the world is like okay God is speaking here about being filled and being satisfied yes. okay. we have to have in we have to come to know I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I was in the advertising business before I got saved. And we're always desperately trying to create felt needs in people's lives. All right? When you're hungry and thirsty, nobody has to create that. That's there. I mean, you, you need that, okay? Uh, think about this. In the Garden of Eden, now the first sin is attributed to Adam, but the Satan first attacked, the serpent attacked the woman. Just think about this. That woman had everything that a woman could need. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's impossible for us now to experience in the natural mm -hmm. what she had thanks to her and Adam. Right. Okay? Think about this. She had a perfect husband. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes. She had a perfect home with no taxes or utility bills. <laughs> she had everything that she could possibly need just for the reaching out and taking. Mm -hmm. And yet the serpent came along and planted the seed of dissatisfaction, of discontent. Yeah. He got her to act on what she wanted rather than what she needed. He helped create a felt need in her life, mm -hmm. which she acted upon, right? What do you need? What do you want? What do you desire? All right? I pray that it's that it's that righteous relationship being right with God the Father that drives your life. See, Jesus, who searches the heart of men, knows all and addresses this this human, very human condition. And Jesus said, Why then? Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Okay, that's God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 2. Don't, we work for, we strive for things and then find out they don't satisfy. Right. All it's right. temporary. Righteousness feeling. and a right relationship with God the Father will fill you. It will satisfy you. Jesus said, then, then he said to him, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance... Does his life consist of his possessions? Luke 12, 15. I don't know how old you are. I know how old I am. I've been around the block once or twice. But one of the things I know is that the world can't satisfy you. What the, what the world is able to give you, and at the end of the day, will not satisfy you. It's not lasting, okay? It's like cotton candy. It, it is, and that's an expert voice. This is a, one of the most misused verses, I think, in, in the church today, is this. In Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Well, hallelujah. That's the Word of God. Mm. That is true, right? Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. I asked, well, what do you desire, right? And then God spoke, I mean, here's the conversation in the book of Job, right? If you return to the Almighty, this is Elihu speaking to, um, I think it's Elihu speaking to, to Job. He says, if you return to the Almighty, you'll be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Job 22, 23 and 6. You see, we think that the silver and gold will satisfy. And God is saying, no, you know, what satisfies is me, all right? And then the prophet Isaiah. This is from the 58th chapter, and this is about the Sabbath, all right? If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, 
and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. By the way, let me ask you, what day exactly is it that you're supposed to desist from your own ways? What day of the week is it that you're supposed to not seek your own pleasure and speak your own word? Um, what day of the week is it that you're supposed to take the light in the Lord? Okay. Every day. Then every day is the Sabbath. That's right. That's when you learn to rest in the Lord. That's the, that's the truth. We're supposed to appraise things spiritually. God spoke through Jeremiah and he said, I will fill the soul of the priest with abundance and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 14. You want something that's satisfied? If you want to be filled, if you want to be satisfied, seek the goodness of God. The Lord wants to give us the desire of our hearts. But the Lord wants to be the desire of our hearts. I want to be able to say, like that psalmist said, Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you I desire nothing on earth. He's the only one that can fill our hearts. But how many of us today, honestly, I mean, let, you know, let's, let's really be honest about this. How many of us can say, I desire nothing on earth? No, what I want, and beside you, I desire nothing. That we have this passion for God, mm. that we do pan for Him like a the deer pants for the water. Okay, this is this is the the heritage of the saints of God. That we would have this. You know why? Because it satisfies. Because it fills. When we seek God, when we seek His righteousness, it says you'll be satisfied. That's right. But you have to taste and, and see, see that, that the, the Lord, Lord is, is good. good. Amen. To Once that. you have a taste. My goodness. <laughs> She's right. Write that down. She, because that's absolutely right. And, you know, one of the other things I just want to mention here. I've talked about it so much. Uh, and I, I think most people that I talk to don't really make this connection. We kind of, as we study the Sermon on the Mount, and we're taking it apart, piece by piece, verse by verse, often word by word. But the fact is, I could almost say, and think about this, that the Beatitudes, this is the Sermon. Okay. This is the, the sermon. Right, but the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is commentary on right. that sermon. sermon. That's right. Okay? God wants to bless you. Mm. That is that is the truth. So he says here, you know, seek his righteousness, well, and you know, you'll be satisfied, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then as we get into the Sermon on the Mount, you get on a little bit later, and he says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, righteousness, and all the rest, all things, will be yeah. added to you. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's like the world has us, everybody, running around chasing things to be satisfied, to find their pleasure, and they're never, they're never satisfied. Okay, they're illusions. They, yes, they're illusions. But the world has us chasing illusions. What God is saying, He's saying, if you seek His righteousness, seek that right relationship with Him, and He becomes a desire of your heart, everything else will be taken care of. Everything else will be. You'll have all the things you need. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 one of the books that I am writing about done is called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. Okay. One of his plans, his plots, his devices mm -hmm. is distraction. We're called to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And he is always trying to get us to get our eyes off of him. Right? right. You know, in Psalm 90, 91, it talks about the God will deliver us from the snare of the trapper. Well, if you, if you, you know, I'm a city boy. I've not spent a lot of time out in the woods trapping things. Mm -hmm. But I know this much, that if you're going to set a trap for something, you bait it. Yes. Right? And you bait it with something that will attract whatever you're seeking, right? Mm -hmm. how, does, how does Satan know what to bait a trap with to get you off that narrow path of righteousness and get you off to go over to where the trap is? What does he put there? We tell him what we want. We tell him exactly. Yeah, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, you, you're, if you're just consumed with a desire for a new car, you're going to be talking about that car. Mm -hmm. If you're consumed with a desire for a new job, a new house, a new, you're going to be speaking about that. I don't believe that Satan can read minds, no. but he can listen. Yes. And we tell him what to put in there as, as debate, right? But if we're 
because we get distracted. Instead of keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and following him on that path of righteousness, all of a sudden we're looking over, we're looking over at that newest fashion, we're looking over at that newest car. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Don't get distracted. Because, listen, you know the saying, love makes the world go around? It doesn't. Okay? In the natural, in this, this whole world, it's discontentment that makes the world go around. Because it's money that makes the world go around. And being discontent makes you go out and spend the money. You know, this is what advertising is generally about. They want to get you discontent with the car you're driving, so you'll go out and buy a new one. They want to get you discontent with the clothes you're wearing, so you'll go out and buy all the new stuff. That's right. Satan is trying to always instill discontentment when what God wants you to be is content. content. All right. I'm satisfied. Discontentment. All right. Economies are built on it. It makes you know wars are started because of it, and it's pride that leads to a sense of entitlement, mm -hmm. that leads to discontentment, that leads to war. Just go read 1 Peter 2.11 and James 4.1. I mean, I'm not making this up. This is the Word of God. Think about that, that father of our faith way back Abraham. when. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go back to Abraham. Abraham. Right? It says in Genesis 25.8 that Abraham breathed his last and died at a ripe old age. An old man and satisfied. King James says, and full, right? Satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. It's interesting because the word full, uh, that's from an old Anglo-Saxon Anglo word called fullian, which meant to whiten. Yes. Right? And I'm going to get into this and show you this in Scripture. To full right. something is to press or scour cloth in a mill. This is an art of great antiquity. And, you know, it's made mention in Scripture of fuller's soap. Right? Jesus, his clothes were whitened when he went up on a mount of transfiguration, as no fuller's soap could do. So making something white, a garment white, is not about you don't not putting something into it. It's removing the, the impurity, the dirt's out of it. Okay, extracting, extracting, right? That's the, that's to remove the impurities, to remove the dirt. But it says in Malachi, but who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Yes. To remove what's not supposed to be there. And that is transfiguration. As I said, the Lord's raiment is said to have been white. So no, whiter than, so no, as no fuller on earth could white them. We don't, you know, we think about being full. We think about adding stuff. Right. The, the word has as its root, removing, removing. stuff. It's removing the, the things that distract from, from satisfaction, okay? To make us full, to make us satisfied, is not to add something, but to remove something. To remove the things that are not God. The things that weigh us down. The things that are not God. In the Psalms, as for me, I will, I will behold thy faith in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm 17. And me, I plan on looking you full in the face. When I get up, I'll see your full stature like heaven on earth. That's the message. It's not the same thing. Fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ, seeing him, will bring you satisfaction. And that is the truth. We'll pick this up again in our next program because there's stuff here that we need to see. So, Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you, Lord God, for your word that opens your plan, your plan opens you to us that we can see you and I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we would continue to see you more clearly in and through your word father in amen. Jesus precious name amen till next time God bless you and goodbye on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of Suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners